Welcome back, everyone, to D-Pad Dialogue. I am Garrett Weinzerl, and I am sitting here with my business professor friends, Robert and Steven, and we're here to talk about gaming industry news from a business perspective. How are you guys doing today? As excited as you are. Not quite as excited as you are. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's pretty early for, for all of us, and, and the coffee hasn't really kicked in, so I'm not sure that's a good way to gauge how we're all doing collectively. I'm not sure that's the best, the best way to handle it. But... Uh, we'll we'll take it. We'll take it as it is. What is it we, in Java Veritas? Yeah, yeah. We come as we are on this show. <laughs> we come as we are. Uh, anyway, our topic today, if you choose to accept it, and if you don't, too bad. We're going to do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about esports, specifically just the, the the giant rise in it and how it seems to be uh, affecting the development of some, but not all, games, uh, and and why that may be. We have dedicated esports arenas already having popped up and popping up around the globe we have esports heading to tbs here in the states major cable network uh to me almost seems kind of strange it's almost like we're moving backwards going back to uh, old school cable but i'm still excited for it nonetheless uh and just the 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 sales numbers is absolutely ridiculous for all of this so um robert what do you think of all this what do you think of esports do you think it should be uh, taken into account when you're developing your game uh, do you think it's too much of a risk to to lean on that too hard because you're not sure if it's going to take off or not? I don't think so. I think, uh, yeah, esports are a thing. Uh, they're becoming a massive thing. And uh, I think very shortly they're going to own the world, um, not quite to the level that the NFL drives popular <clears throat> culture and, and events and entertainment in the U.S., but damn near close. I know last year they eclipsed the uh, NBA, in viewership numbers um and the nba is not as hot as it was you know 10 years ago but still i mean that's a major professional sports the money is bigger than wimbledon or the masters or other things that we have significant television and legitimacy to uh colleges are starting to add programs there's tournaments everywhere there's uh two guys last year that made more than two million dollars uh playing video games uh, and that was not in sponsorships. That was just in prize money. Mm -hmm. You start right. adding sponsorship numbers. I mean, there are guys in the NFL f signing these 10-year, $300 million sponsorship contracts. Um, it's coming. I mean, these esports celebrities, uh, uh, these players are, are, are becoming a big deal. I even saw an article now that perhaps they need to start paying more attention to their, their handles and make sure they don't have overlap. Because right now there are multiple professional players with the same name. Mm -hmm. And now the way it's handled is people will just shame one or the other of them to try to change their name, you know, that, that this is the person who owns it. Um, but that, I think, is going to become a big thing as they start to get branded. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be... It's going to be but huge. Yeah. The issue of, of, of handles, of players not going by their real name and going by whatever their gamer tag or uh, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, uh, it, it is super strange, right? And, and yeah. it's not necessarily the main talking point for today's show, but like, you know, people have out there their their handle is a copyrighted figure. You have people who are named after Lord of the Rings references and Game of Thrones references, and then you also have people, you know, going way back into StarCraft too, just like someone named Fruit Dealer. Yeah, I mean, there's it's it's holdovers from the old hacker culture um, <clears throat> where you needed the anonymity so you didn't go to jail. Uh, well, see, the question becomes if you're going to try to everything. partner, how, how do you partner sponsorship with anonymity? Right. And I think that's the long-term question. I mean, you can obviously brand like, like uh, PewDiePie or something like that. You, you can brand off of this, but you still have a name that's associated and that, that could work. Right. Absolutely. And, that, and that's, I think, what Robert was, was talking about, where it's, it's a problem if two players have the same name. Yeah. Well, and some of them are kind of generic. I mean, I uh, was watching watching the starcraft finals and you get names like life and sos i mean yeah, these are just Plessy generic oh. bland <laughs> names no, but be able to google that you google michael jordan you find michael jordan you google life you're probably gonna i don't know find a magazine you'll never find him and a cereal <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah life cereal way before you'd find the oh. the guy who <laughs> won the whole damn thing absolutely so i it, i i was i always found that strange i always thought for, for me, real names made more sense, but I don't know. It's also an international audience, and if you're sitting here in the U.S., you probably don't know how to spell half of the names of the people coming over from, from Europe and South Korea. Uh, 
Yeah. And that's just an issue with, with us and our, <laughs> and our ability to know how to spell international names. But um, Yeah, or fit them onto our keyboards with our alphabet. That, that too. <laughs> yeah, because journalists are, well, I mean, they're going to work with the tools they've got. And that's a pain. Yeah. You know, just using, just having the accents for ones that do use the same alphabet. Mm-hmm. You know, I know there's a complaint right now among the French that French keyboards are, in, keyboards are inefficient and they hate them. Um, and they've stopped using accents and they're changing their words uh, to fit a more standard keyboard. Yeah. So. And what about the development side of things? I kind of posed that question. Um, do, do, do we think it's wise from, from the ground up to try and build a game that is going to be an eSport? Because traditionally that hasn't ha- been how it, how it, kind, of, how it kind of works. Uh, it seems to be very community-based. We seem to have lost Steven for a moment. Yep. Yep. Um, so I think uh, it's to the point where you have to be cognizant of it that maybe not try to design to be an eSport because you never know if it's going to take off. But I think as you're designing your game, if it has the possibility to be an eSport, you better build in the tools. Right. That's 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 a good point. I mean, obviously, I'm 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 talking from very personal, like <laughs> from a personal side of things. But when when Hearthstone first released, everyone was uh, tournaments popped up almost immediately, and we didn't have a way. We didn't have spectator mode. It wasn't in the game, and it seemed uh, to a lot of us at the time unthinkable that it wouldn't have been baked into the game from day one. Right. But then you go and you talk to the folks who made the game, uh, talk to Team Five. Talk to Eric Dodds and ask him, you know, why wasn't this in the game from the get go? And he just said, "We didn't, we didn't know. We don't, we don't go in expecting our game to have this type of success." Um, and I think to a point, that's probably a safe way to develop your game. Yeah, try and make the best game that you can, and and not necessarily aim aim for esports because I don't think you can you can guarantee that there's going to be that type of pickup on your. Uh, on your title, things going, on. and we're back, Stephen. We have we have we have brought you back from the ether of of internets. I've moved to an entirely new building. I'm going apparently, back. Apparently, not, not he hasn't really, guys. He's just using a different computer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, so we were talking about going out of your way uh, from the ground up to develop your game to be an esport, whether that's a smart idea, whether it isn't. Um, uh, and I was starting to talk about. Uh, using Hearthstone as an example, um, when Hearthstone came out, tournaments started popping up almost immediately. But there was no there was no spectator feature. There was no easy way to actually watch a game that you were not yourself playing. So it was hard to broadcast a tournament. People started having to screen share on Skype and capture the screen and hope to God things like what just happened on the show don't happen to a live tournament with thousands of dollars <laughs> on the line. Um, and when you'd go and when we went and talked to to Team Five about it and said, you know, hey, how was how was spectator mode not not a feature from from day one? Why well, wasn't it just baked into this game? And they said, well, we didn't know it was going to be this successful. We didn't we don't plan games uh, thinking that they're going to be a huge success, thinking that they're immediately going to have an esport because uh, it seems like maybe less so now than back then. Um, it seemed like they. The esports for, for Blizzard, anyway, was very much a, a community thing. It wasn't something that they heavily, you know, they, they took a heavy hand in making happen. They basically put their product out there and said, hey, community, if you want this to be an esport, it can be. Do your own tournaments. Do your own thing. Now we have um, a major Blizzard tournament for almost every single one of their games, with the exception of maybe things like Diablo that just don't have a player versus player environment. Right. Um, but I, I, I find that I find that interesting because it, with esports it really does come down to the community. Right. If, if if there's an audience for it, that a an audience that want to play it become really good at it and proficient. Uh, B an audience that's going to actually go find money, build a prize pool, start a tournament from the ground up, and C an audience that actually don't want to play the game, they just want to watch people be good and play the game. Um, and I don't think that's something you can necessarily guarantee. No, no, I don't think you can guarantee. But uh, let's just stick with Blizzard for a moment. So, uh, you know, Hearthstone was an unexpected esport success, which they weren't prepared for. And now you look just a little, little bit later. They've they bought MLG. They brought in a guy from um, to to run their esport division. Heroes is taken off, and uh, there was a story that even during the development of Overwatch, that they gave some money to the QA guys 
to have a little party because they had done so much work and they immediately turned that in. They, they asked if they could run their own internal tournament with that money instead. So even the developers are starting to have this in mind of, you know, our game's in development. We want to run our own eSport internal tournament before the game is even finished. Yeah, that is the difference, right? Because yeah. you look at something like Overwatch and it seems, it seems uh, what's groomed for eSports from day one. We right. have a spectator mode already in the beta. We had it in the beta before it went down when it was the most feature light thing I think I've ever touched from Blizzard. It was literally just uh, going to a game and try and kill people. That was all there was to the game, but there was also a spectator mode and custom games. Like that was, that was it. Right. Um, so it, it does seem, it, 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 I'm sure the attitude changes from team to team at Blizzard because there's not a whole lot of, there, there's almost no intermingling, it seems, between teams. Um, so the, the Overwatch team probably went in with a different mindset than the Hearthstone team. Well, I, I think that might have been reflective of the entire industry's mindset, though. It's shifted. Now, you know, esports are huge. You want to keep them in mind because you there's a billion dollars out there. You want your piece. Oh, the, the real question for me is the stickiness. You know, we've got a couple ones that have been around for a while. StarCraft, Dota, uh, League of Legends, etc. that have been on. And, and running for a while, but a lot of these other ones are are sooner. I mean, Hearthstone is now what two years into this process. Yes. Um, a lot of the other ones are, you know, again, are very new. You can invest millions or something and hope for the community, hope for um, you know the the interest and the competitive scene. Um, but are they going to be here? Are these games going to exist in five years? And so, how you know how do you balance some of these decisions? You know, I use the NFL as an example earlier, Robert. Okay, sure, yeah, the NFL's existed for 70, 80, whatever years of an actual professional league. That's a pretty seriously sticky thing you can invest in. Um, if it's instead we introduce a new game every year, you know, where do we get saturation in the market of esports as well as when do we start to see turnover? You know, StarCraft still exists. StarCraft is still doing its thing. Is there a point in which StarCraft is less interesting to people and it disappears? Well, things come and go. Just look at uh, CSGO. Mm -hmm. You know, that was big, went away, and now it's back. Huge. So, it's massive now. I mean, it's it's the, the most watched. Uh, it's got the most tournaments. It's just gone insane. It's about to be on TBS. And that's an old, relatively old game. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think they've got to, it's like anything else in entertainment. Things are going to go in waves, and the smarter companies will go with the wave uh, and keep innovating and keep in mind that, hey, this might be an eSport. So we better have the minimal tools in it so that we aren't caught flat-footed. Um, that if ours catches fire as an eSport for a year, we can get the money from it and then just move on to our next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they have the basic back-end infrastructure and think of, hey, we're going to produce a series of smaller games. Um, and again, it's just blizzards in my head on this because there was World of Warcraft, which ate the world. Mm -hmm. And then they went, maybe it's okay to have smaller games that don't last till the end of time <laughs> right overwatch was originally going to be their next mmo yeah and they had to trash it yeah and they, and they axed it and what we're left with now is is it is strictly just a pvp team-based shooter yep and it's great by the way uh if, if anyone's wondering it's really fun oh my god yes <laughs> You like to learn more? Go watch Overwatchers. <laughs> yes, go check out Overwatchers with me and a Frenchman. <laughs> but uh, and what, what do you guys think of? Um, there's a lot of discussion right now going on about uh, on the flip side of what I just said, which is you. I think for the most part, you can't really plan on something being an esport. Right. You can't develop for it. Uh, but the flip side of that, there's a lot of discussion going on right now that. Uh, if you're one of the big monolithic developers that you can, you can just throw money at it because if you have a million dollar tournament, people are going to want to get good, go play in it, win the money, and people are going to want to watch it because there's huge stakes uh, that you can kind of force. It. You can throw money at the problem and, and make it an esport versus uh, if you're a smaller company, if if you know, right. if your game is Rocket League and you just kind of came out of nowhere and you're still building up you probably don't have the capital to just be like, okay, and we've got a $500,000 world championship this year for this game. Um, like you can kind of, it's, it's not necessarily a fair space. Uh, yeah. Massive corporations have always had the ability to force market space just through sheer power of marketing. Um, it doesn't mean they'll win. Um, 
not everyone can, you know, be Microsoft and throw a hundred million dollars to say, you know, go use Bing. Um, right. Or, or another example with them is the original Xbox. They, they just operated at a, at a loss for years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Sony, it was huge at that. That's why you can't buy Zenith TV. Um, you know, in owning market space, you can buy market space. We talked about this in the previous one in standard setting, um, that you can buy a win if you're big enough. But then there are the little guys like Rocket League that can come out of nowhere, and now we're going to be the only one that's really on every platform, or every platform that matters. Um, yeah, they're they're it's amazing, really growing rapidly. They they just launched on the Xbox with with everything and some additional stuff. I I, I want to get it just so I can drive around with a damn warthog from Halo in Rocket League. <laughs> um, and I, it is an exciting game. I don't know if you guys have watched it. it it's it's fantastic as an esport because uh, I have played it. I am terrible at it. I have watched professionals play it, and it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, most video games. I think this is one of the reasons I think esports will take off quicker and longer than even traditional sports have, because you can completely suck and still play and have fun. Yeah, and not worry about getting you know broken. <laughs> Yeah, there's something I can't go play football all the time on on Into the Nexus, and we talked about it back when we did Starcast, which was the thing that is is special about esports that there, there is is not a one to one comparison with traditional sports. Is you, you can watch these professionals, you can watch them play um, and and do what they are doing, and then you can go and play in the exact same environment as almost as if it does exist in a vacuum because it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can actually try this at home, kids. Well, one one huge advantage you have for esports versus traditional is there. There we have this celebrity notion that um, professional athletes are different, right? And they live in their own little world. They do their thing, and we just see them compete. With esports, I mean, the the they just released the um, Twitch end of year data, and they said they had, um, I think it was four billion hours viewed on Twitch last year. Um, you want to learn about how to play, you actually can watch these guys. Maybe not the best of the best, but very, 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 very good people who are playing. And you can watch them play, and you can ask them questions, and they're going to respond to you. You, you. you don't get that. If I wanted to know what Michael Jordan was doing, to go back to the earlier reference, I, you know, how did you come up with that decision? Well, you have to go through the news reporter who has access to him for you know five minutes a day. So you're not going to get that feedback and you're not going to understand how it's developed and you're not going to understand all the things that they got to, whereas this, you see it and you see it then. Yeah, absolutely. When Twitch was first first getting off the ground, uh, StarCraft II was the big popular game. Uh, and you very quickly saw uh, the different streamers, be uh, streamers becoming more popular when they were good at doing commentary while they played, mm -hmm. doing a stream of consciousness, talking about why they're making the decision that they're making, why they're doing the build that they're, you know, that they're building. Um, versus people who just kind of sat quietly and listened to music in the background. Right. Well, yeah, granted, just if they, if they just won GSL and they're not good at talking, people are going to watch them anyway. Right. But for the most part, uh, the ones that were better at at giving players what Stephen just described uh, saw more success in their stream. Yeah, and on Twitch, you can watch people play any game. I mean, the games are there. It's the esport games that are the top viewed games, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, even in that that venue, I mean. Esports are driving sales. Uh, I don't think we actually brought it up. It's in our notes that the top five out of five out of the top ten sales games are esport games, specifically digital PC games. But yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's a huge space now. Just digital sales in general. Um, uh, three of those: are League of Legends, World of Warcraft, and World of Tanks. Uh, but there's also console titles that break into that. Call of Duty, FIFA, and Madden are in the top ten for consoles. Uh, and uh, I did not know Madden had an eSport <laughs> scene, but apparently it does, is according to Fortune.com. Yeah. And then um, there was also an article that uh, Black Ops is coming out with uh, multiplayer SKU, where you don't get the... We always talked about the difference between you know a Call of Duty game and a Battlefield game, was the Call of Duty games had unbelievably awesome single-player experiences. Yeah. Right. And then Battlefield was only good multiplayer and it had this other thing they tacked on. Right. Um, but now even, you know, the Call of Duty is going, well, you know, esports are driving games. Let's give the people the opportunity to buy the gimped multiplayer only part that they may just want to play with their friends. Part of me is still surprised we've never seen either a a cheaper version, which I'm assuming this multiplayer only version of Black Ops will be, or a free to play. Like, I, I'm surprised we haven't seen Battlefield attempt a free to play model. Yeah, I think this is uh, 15 bucks for the multiplayer. Okay. 
yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> at that point might as well be free um that's not a, a large chunk of money that you're gonna agonize over spending or not i know they're getting it down to the hey my buddies play i don't care about the you know the single player and it's eh, 15 bucks like, impulse yeah. purchase well, yeah. since they had cut out the the reselling aspect of stuff, you know, if you bought the battlefield used, you couldn't get online without paying another fifteen dollars or something. You know, I think that that does change some of the metrics as they as they decide to make this a multiplayer only game. Well, because they've cut out all the stores, um, GameSpot, and then in the the UK game, uh, which Gary and I were talking about, is just horrible branding. Um, <laughs> are doing everything they can to get outside of the, the physical unit sales and game actually bought an esport company. So they're, these companies are looking at ways to diversify into this area because they see that digital, um, content, you know, not physical content is the way people want to go. Uh, you can do, if it's a lot easier to do a $15 impulse purchase from home than having to go all the way into a store, hope they have it, get the box, then come home and then still have to wait an hour for the digital download patch. Yeah. Um, so I will say I, my most recent game purchase was Fallout 4. I got it discounted by getting a physical copy, but the physical copy, all it was, was a code for Steam. So I thought that was interesting. They sent me a box. With a Steam a code. code for Steam. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, I bet, uh, Amazon has definitely sucked me into buying stuff through them just to get the thing. It's 20% 20, 20 discount. At one of these days, got you laugh now. One of these days, CDs uh, and hard copies are going to be uh, thought of as vinyls for video games. Hey, vinyls back, man! <laughs> I know. I bought. I had one come the other day, and you know what happened? I opened it up, got my vinyl, and out slid a little digital code for a MP3 copy of the album. <laughs> yeah. Well, I bought a, a Blu-ray disc the other day, and I still haven't put the Blu-ray in because it came with the digital code. <laughs> They're just like, yeah, hey, screw it. <laughs> so I just went with that. I'm, I'm a bit of a snob there. I still like my Blu-rays because the sound quality is impeccable. And uh, if I'm having a bad Wi-Fi day, I don't get, you know, I don't get a digital pixelated version of Harry Potter. Well, yeah, but this is a way I could watch my violent movie without having to figure out how to do it when my daughter's not home. <laughs> oh, that's that's a good point. Yeah. That's, so it was just, but still, I felt like an ass. <laughs> I bought a Blu-ray so I could get the digital download. It was just like, yeah, that was dumb. Yeah. But I do like having the disc. It sits in a drawer and it makes me happy. So let me let me pose a slightly different question. Yep. We've been talking about, you know, esports is the future. There's a lot going here. But a lot of this stuff has been very focused on organic game development. We're folk you know, we're de you know, maybe it's a franchise, where, you know, we're we're Counter Strike thirty seven or whatever it might be. Um but what we haven't seen really is a game that is IP connected otherwise. You know, obviously everything that Blizzard does is cross platforming, but we're not seeing something like Lord of the Rings, the esport. We're not seeing Harry Potter, the esport. Are we going to see something like that? I don't know. Crappy film tie in game is, is it's, its own meme. Traditionally, right. yeah, licensed games are bad. Traditionally, Fair enough. There are a few yeah. that, that break the mold, but. Yeah. Um, Shadows we of Mordor? Think Battlefront, the. the Esport, you know that kind of an idea. Saying we love Star Wars, why not create a esport around that? That's a different approach, and yeah. may have some of that stickiness that that you know I was talking about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. But we haven't seen anything successful. Is that the next phase? The game needs to be good. It needs to be good and have a have a, a skill like a skill gap. There needs to be a noticeable like gap between players who are exceptional and excel at this game and your average player. Uh, yeah. And if you do not have that. Um, I don't think it's going to be a successful esport. Now, I'm not saying Battlefront is bad. I own it. I have a really good time with it. It is one of uh, my relaxing games right now. I'm just like, mm, I don't I just want to be left alone and just shoot stormtroopers. That's what I go and do. <laughs> um, I don't think that the game necessarily has the mechanics uh, or the or that kind of that skill ceiling that is required of a game that's going to have an esport. Now, again, who makes that? EA. EA could go throw money at the problem and be like, we're going to have a 100, you know, a, a two million dollar Battlefront tournament. People, I would guarantee you people would watch it. You would get players that would start training and teams would form and, and go and try and be really good at Battlefront. Right. Yeah, but it's not going to happen well, organically with the right, game. It's not gonna, I don't think you're – exactly. I don't think you're going to have the community go out of their way to go scrimp and save and, and shake down every sponsor they can find out of a tree to throw money at this. Yeah, but I like Steven's idea because think if it was designed that way and it's Star Wars. 
Yeah. yeah, I would watch that. It could be. It could. It probably would be the number one esport game because it would drag in unbelievable numbers of players. I'm saying if it was a really good esport game designed that way. Well, yes. It, it, and then you add on this massive IP. Yeah, but that that's um. Think of all like the non gamer viewers you would get. Right, right. No, and I, I'm I'm agreeing with you. What I'm I'm saying though is I think it's difficult to guarantee that your game will be good. Oh well, yeah. Despite whatever your intentions were. But if someone could get that secret sauce of yeah. get the the cool mainstream IP tacked on to the proper esport game. Mm -hmm. Um because I think in a, a smaller version of this, this is exactly what Blizzard does. They drag their IPs around and that gets people to be interested. I never would have played the damn MOBA. Don't like MOBAs. I went into league. Everybody there was an ass hat. Uh, I just didn't want to be in that environment. And I thought, well, it's Blizzard though. And I want to play these characters and you know. Right. Uh, but at the same time though, there's a good example of a company that has all the clout in the world and all the money to throw at problems. And honestly, Heroes has not been that successful of an esport. No, but it can be if they want it to be. Right. And then, and the, the, the Blizzard tournament itself is pretty big, but that's, that's it as far as Heroes is concerned. There are not uh, grassroots uh, tournaments for the most part that are really taken off for Heroes. Not yeah, to the extent I of something like you have with League of Legends or Hearthstone. I, I agree, but I do think we do need to take into account that League and Dota, I mean, own that space and have right. owned it for a while, and they have such huge install bases that you can't discount the little third guy who comes in, you know, even though Blizzard's massive, you know. Right. It's freaking <laughs> Activision Blizzard is massive, but that they're around at all. There usually isn't any room for a third player. Uh, if you're not one or two, you're, you get out of the market. That's yeah, the, you're old, done. the GE way. Yeah. Uh, number three almost always tanks. Number two usually tanks. Um, so that they've, they've gotten any traction at all to be as large as they are, I think says something about the game. They just entered, entered a super saturated space. Yeah, I also find it interesting that the top two are so similar uh, in the game type. Mm -hmm. League of Legends and Dota that are the top two esports and they're very similar games. Right. I've also noticed among the players, uh, at least in the, the collegiate crowd, that it's the most clicky crap you've ever seen. Um, every other game, they'll intermix. You know, the FPS guys and the Halo guys and all those. They'll, they'll talk to the League people, but the League and the Dota people, I mean, it's freaking Cold War, man. <laughs> it's not that cold. Yeah, you either, like, you either love one or you love the other, and you probably have a very sore opinion of the, the opposite for some reason. Well, and not just the game. The person that would even consider playing the game. Mm, that's I mean, true. I mean, it's astounding to the, the, the level of venom uh, that seemed to be between the two camps, which I don't think is generated by either of the companies. Uh, I think it's just the nature of, you know, it's Microsoft and Apple again. Right. So, but again, there was no third player. Uh, you know, no one really cared about Amiga. So if anybody remembers Amiga. Commodore uh, 64. Yeah. Um, so I, I think Blizzard has, has done well. And I think the reason they've done so well uh, as they have with Heroes was the, the bleed over the IP, dragging people in who otherwise wouldn't have gone, taking a, an accessibility approach that the other two clearly don't have. Um, but they also don't, it's, it's hard to be, it's hard to go around saying how awesome you are in a game that rewards everyone equally with XP. And a lot of people like to go, particularly gamers, that I'm awesome and you're not. <laughs> so that's kind of part of the thing. So I think that's held them back. Um, I think they're walking a very difficult line between accessibility for everyone and being able to go around and be elite. That's a good point. But it also, also I'm sure that they tapped into players that I, I don't they, they tapped into a market where they weren't necessarily taking players away from the existing MOBAs they created new mobile players because they developed a game that way right. would they have seen as much success if they went more traditional uh, <coughs> along the lines of something like Dota or League of Legends where you can be the star you can carry the team right so it's, it's a very tough road that they're going with that one um, it's hard coming in third uh, I think it's much better in the ones where they're moving more with a first pers uh, first mover advantage. Because Hearthstone, I mean, you got to really say that was the first one. Magic, 
just wasn't on the online world in that, a yeah, accessible magic way. Yeah, huge, just not online. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, now you can go and you can watch Magic on Twitch, but it's never going to see Hearthstone numbers, I think. Um, which yeah. is fine. There's also part of... There's, there's something to be said for you don't need to be the best. You just need to find... You, you know, however you define success for yourself is, is fine as long as you are somewhat successful. I mean, you can't just say, well, it failed. You have three people watching. It's a success. Yeah, but so the standard way companies can do this, you can get the first mover advantage or you can be the fast follower who says, thanks for, you know, driving all that marketing and ground and creating a space consumer. for me. Uh, like uh, the old Burger King model. I don't know. I don't need to know where to put in a burger place. I'll just look where McDonald's puts one in and put it across the street. Say, thanks, McDonald's. Um, so you don't even have to be as successful. You saved all that money on the marketing and the exploration and all those upfront costs. Let the other guy do it. But then yeah. there's the problem of if you wait too long, you know, how do you break through the clutter? So there's a lot of uh, look at personalities on YouTube. The big ones there aren't because of the best. A lot of them are there because they got there first. You know, they own the space and it, now it's saturated and it's too hard to find anybody. So you find the people that are already there. Well said. Yeah, that night just killed the mood. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's just, I think it's a good, I think you wrapped it up well. There you go. No. Uh, I think that's a good place to, to end the conversation unless you, uh, you guys have any other closing thoughts. No, oh, I'm good. Yep. Esports are huge. Yeah, and fun. And yeah, and very fun. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, that'll do it for this one. Want to remind everyone you can email into the show by writing us at dpadcast at gmail.com. And uh, wherever we go, subscribe on iTunes if you haven't already. And uh, Robert, where can folks find you? I'm at uh, RS Macy on Twitter. Steven? S.E. Humphrey at Twitter. I'm at Garrett Art on Twitter, and you can find all of the other podcasts I do at amove.tv. That's A-M-O-V-E dot TV. That'll do it for this week. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a good one.